Pete Doctor is here with me in Studio Q. Hello, nice to meet you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Okay, so this um, this is a really high concept plot in this this new film. H- how did you even come up with the idea um, to set the next movie inside the brain of an eleven year old? Well, yeah. Okay, so uh, we like to think of it as the mind and not the brain. I make the distinction make the only distinction because for us. Uh, we have made up this entire world. It's full of places like long term memory, uh, dream production, subconscious, kind of more, um, what would you say, abstract places as opposed to dendrites and blood vessels and things like that. So um, we the basic concept came from me just thinking, what would be fun in animation? Uh, what about, what if we could somehow take these ideas, these feelings, fear, sadness, disgust, joy, and make them into characters? Almost like, uh, you know, if we do this right, it, it could be like our version of the seven dwarfs, right? Where each one of them has a very distinct, uh, definite and caricatured way of approaching the world. So that's kind of where it was born. And then as we got into it, uh, my daughter, who was around uh, 11, I think she just turned 12, she actually did the voice of young Ellie in Up. So at the very beginning, that little spunky kid, she um, was just turning 11 or 12, and she was becoming very different, very quiet and reserved, as you know kids do Mm. as they move from the spirited young age into a little bit older. And uh, we started thinking, geez, what's going on inside her head? And that's really what led to the making of this film. And as you had that question for yourself, what what, what is going on inside my 11, 12-year-old daughter's head? Um, what was your feelings? I mean, were, were, were you afraid? Were you like, what's going on? What's going to happen to this kid as she matures into an adult? Yeah, I was. Because I remember for me, like the most difficult years in my life were junior high. I remember childhood and, and uh, elementary school as this sort of fun place. You're sort of blissfully unaware of everything. And then suddenly you become hyper aware that you're being judged at every turn and everybody's looking at you and taking... I, one girl actually said to me once, didn't you wear that shirt yesterday? Which like <laughs> fulfilled all my deepest, darkest fears, you know, that somebody was taking, uh, tra- keeping track of me. So I was really scared that, that my daughter would be heading to that same dark place. And so you said, "Hey, let's make a let's make a movie about that that time that, that moment in in a kid's life." For you personally, how how has bringing those emotions to life as characters in Inside Out helped you work through your own feelings? Which I think you're suggesting is sort of scared as a parent, like what's going to happen to my kid? Yeah, we started out making a film about our kids, and we ended up making a film about us as parents watching and trying to care for our kids. Um, So the film is really told from Joy's point of view. She's a surrogate parent in the movie, um, voiced by Amy Poehler. And she's one of my favorite characters of all time because she's just got so much energy, vitality. She's really like uh, almost what takes you through the day. She's motivation. Like if you think about a world with no joy, there's almost no reason to get up because Mm. if fear is in charge, well, you could get hit by a bus, you could, all these bad things could happen, you know. So Joy is the one that instigates, that pushes you out into the world, and uh, it's been a it's been a really fun movie to work on. And as you um, were making this movie and researching it, I read that you met with psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, uh-huh. neuroscientists to, to to understand how the human mind works. Mm-hmm. So how did that um, medical research really? How, how did that inform Inside Out? Well, for one, it confirmed that we were hunting in the right territory. Um, I forgot exactly who told us that, uh, this, that of all people in the world, there is no one more hyper in tune and aware of, so, of cues, of uh, expressions and social cues than a, an 11 to 15-year-old girl. So just for whatever reason, socially, whatever, developmentally, um, we figured, okay, we're on, we're on to something here. And then all the way along, I mean, I think the things that really profoundly affected me, um, we got in touch with this guy, Dr. Paul Ekman, who is one of the pioneering researchers in in, uh, uh, expressions and emotions. And he explained that the, the part of us that we think of as us, the part that decides to take the cookie or the piece of fruit or uh, which car I'm going to uh, buy next or whatever. That is actually the part that we think of ourselves as uh, us, but the part that's actually making a lot of the decisions is maybe back behind that somewhere deeper. And it's 
usually all this information that has been learned uh, and it's completely unconscious to you. It's belie- mm. it, it operates below the conscious consciousness and, and it really drives a lot of you. You could have made the decision. I mean, you're trying to root your film in, in the realities of the mind. You could have made another choice, which is just kind of make a fantastical um, film about mm-hmm. our mind. So, so why go the reality route, if I can put it that way? Well, um, we tried, I and mean, that's again why I make the distinction between the mind and the brain, because we did make up a lot of stuff. We try whenever we can, and this is true of all the films we've done at Pixar, to base it on something that either we've observed as artists or that we've gathered uh, you know, via scientists so that it's based on some sort of truth you know, so that, so that there's a basis in reality, even though, because we're going to take this into fin- weird, fantastic mm. places, cars, toys, monsters, whatever. So, because um, we want ultimately, even though it is about all these weird creatures, we want people to be able to look on the screen and go, yeah, that's my life. I understand what that monster is going through. And, and if, if someone just came into our conversation and right now and they, and they didn't know we were, I mean, it, it sounds like a, a film that wouldn't be an animated film. So, <laughs> so, so where, where does animation allow you to go? What does it allow you to convey mm-hmm. um, about the inner workings of our minds that you wouldn't be able to perhaps achieve or achieve as well in another art form? I like to think of animation as almost a, a reduction sauce. So you take all these carrots, you cut them up, and you've got a big pot that's like three liters or whatever, and you distill it down until it's this essence of pure, like, intense taste. And I think animation is kind of like that, too, where we can take all the complexities of a person, for example, and reduce them down to some really potent caricature, uh, and we accept it, and we love it. And uh, so we've been able to do that with anger, uh, you know, with Lewis Black, who's the voice of, of uh, in, a, in our film. Uh, Fear is uh, uh, Bill Hader. So we have all these great characters that, through animation, we're able to caricature and almost, like, turn the volume up on mm. it, you know? And it, so you talk about Joy, but I want to talk about Riley for a second, because mm-hmm. this is the girl who acts as, as the setting for the film, and she's gripped um, by sadness and by anger. We also get a peek inside her subconscious, which is this place um, that's steeped really in her deepest, darkest fears. Yeah. Why, why, why do you want to get kids to get a peek inside what might be like the most painful parts of themselves? <laughs> well, first of all, we try to approach it with a little wink. So in this case, it's full of very frightening things like grandma's vacuum cleaner mm. and broccoli and and uh, you know stuff like that. So it's 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 definitely approached with a little bit of a a, a wink. Um, but also, I think you know, kids uh, like all of us are uh, aware of these dark places in our own persons, and uh, they. I think, you know, I remember watching Pinocchio as a kid and being really scared at Pleasure Island, but then sort of being intrigued by it, like, mm. I want to see that again, you know? So there's, there is something uh, that I think is interesting. There's value kids. in it for yeah, kids to, for sure. to, to sort of go into that place. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so you've mentioned this, but Inside Out features five emotions as its main characters, so joy, anger, disgust, fear, and sadness. And you have to, your job is to actually represent these emotions, these yeah. big things, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as if they're actual people. Yeah, that was I, hard. I know. I know yeah. Well, I know nothing about illustration, but how do you go about illustrating something I mean, it's abstract. If someone asks, most people draw anger. You might, you know, draw a little angry face, but animation, <laughs> the way you do it, is, is much more complex than that. Yeah, we had a, a very talented group of artists, and we set them all off on the same task, and we said, think of these characters, and I would, as much as I could, I would describe them as as a person, right? Joy is very optimistic. She's bubbly. She's always got energy. She just goes, 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 goes until she drops and falls asleep, you know, thinking of uh, people that I know in my own life. And then based on that feeling, and this is where these amazing character designers we have, like uh, Albert Lozano and and Ralph Eggleston, they uh, are able to take those kind of notions of a person and start to make them real. Mm. I don't really understand how they do it, but it's it's... I, I guess it's like writing music. I don't understand how that works either. But, you know, uh, Michael Giacchino on this film, I'm jumping around here. Uh, it's okay. He wrote the music and, and it was based on a feeling. You know, we showed him the film and he just kind of absorbed it and went home and wrote this piece of music, which so 
perfectly captured the feeling of the film. Hmm. Where that comes from, I don't know. But you're the, you're the guy who has to to lead all this. I appreciate there's all these people that, that are doing all this good work, but you have to 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 lead them and and tap into the emotion as much as they do. So do you have to bring yourself back to moments of, of sadness or, or or fear in order to bring the characters to life? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, the characters. You know, we've talked about research, and, and that was definitely true of the emotions as well. You can go through, um, like, what is the purpose of sadness, you know? Why does anybody really want to feel sad? And, and what's the reason for the fact that it still exists after thousands of years of evolution, right? We still feel these feelings, so they must be of some use. Um, so we made a big list of all the things that are pros and cons, things we like, things we don't like about these feelings, but they're all truthful. And then we also just set people off and and you go from that gut feeling of uh, what does it feel like when you're angry? You mm. feel like sort of tense and bunched up and uh, square. And so we went with this very intense red square. It's like a brick, you know. Mm. And, uh, and this is, again, based on fact, when you get angry, your heart rate goes up and your blood is directed towards your fists, to your, to your arms, so you can fight. Versus hmm. fear, which also increases your heart rate, but the blood is directed to your legs so you can run away. So it's all really interesting things that in some way start to inform the direction of the design as well. Pixar, I mean, everyone's familiar with it. It's gotten so much praise and it's, it's known as a film studio with just a, a lot of heart. Hmm. Um, what is, I'm asking you to reveal secrets in a way, but what is the secret to bringing emotional truth to a story? Because it's, it's, we see it fail often on the screen. So what, what is the secret to bringing that? This is, I go back to this term, it is high concept. I mean, the, yes, it's a kid's flick and yes, adults will watch it, but it, it is talking about big things, emotions, big ideas. Hmm. That's a big question. I'm not sure I can even answer that. Um, I think, you know, the films are a reflection of the people that are, are, are working there. Um, and we try to uh, really think of these not as like kitty films. They're films that we would want to make for ourselves, that we want to watch, you know. And we don't make fun of them. Uh, we take all these characters as, as they are alive in some way. They're living, breathing characters. Not to say they're not there's not jokes, but they're, we take it seriously in mm. a sense. And you see them as real. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have real pitfalls and real uh, conditions and things that they need to learn and, and get over. And, you know, in the same way that we ourselves, I think the other key is um, we try, I know I do, uh, to, to infuse the story with some sort of truth uh, that I've gone through in my own life, some difficult uh, usually it's a situation where there's not a clear winner or loser, you know. There's Give me an example. Well, okay, so Monsters, Inc. Uh, was born out of the fact that I love my work. I loved my job, and my wife and I had a kid. And so now suddenly I am wanting to be at work, but then missing his first smile at home. And how can I, I want to be both places, but I can't. And so that's really what uh, Sully in Monsters, Inc. is dealing with this idea of loving work and being all about scaring as his job, and now he's stuck with a kid, and that becomes his obsession, and he doesn't know how to, how to play his life, you know? Mm. And so it's, it's those kind of real-life experiences that, that are complex and, and uh, hopefully uh, things that a lot of people can relate to that, mm. that become the heart of the film. You're a guy who's been at Pixar since you were 21. Yeah. Okay. So you so you've mature matured and been in adulthood involved with with Pixar since its early days. Has has the experience um, of growing older and tapping into a broader range, maybe or new and di different emotions, changed you as an animator? I mean, could you have done this at twenty, or what? What would you have done perhaps differently than you do now? No, I don't think I could have. Um, and you know, it's funny. I'll, I'll once in a while I'll have ideas for a film. Uh, and for whatever reason, it doesn't go, or I, I uh, you know, put it on a shelf, or usually in the file cabinet. And then years later, I'll come back to it and go, oh, I remember what I was feeling when I, but I can't make that now. You know, it has to be somehow relevant and touch on. Usually, it's almost like going to therapy or something, where at the beginning, I don't really know why I'm so drawn to this, <laughs> but some reason I am really drawn to it. And then the more you work through it, you start to dig out the, the reason, you know. <laughs> and, and do you think you could have done this if you weren't a father? No, not at so all. So what, what is that about that part of you that allows you to do this? 
it's one thing to read about stuff, and it's a totally different thing to experience it yourself um, and to go through it. And uh, I think, man, the the fact that I could watch my kids and uh, relate to them and identify having gone through it myself, but now having this weird different perspective. You know, like I say, the film is really uh, told from a parent's point of view. And if I wasn't a parent, it would be hollow and false. And and probably because Ellie turned out okay through her transition from she's, 11 she's to, to 12 years yeah. old. Um, I, I want to ask you, Eb, you're responsible, I put this on you, Uh-oh. for one of the most heartbreaking movie scenes perhaps of all times <laughs> at least in recent memory and this is the opening scene in up where the main character loses the love of his life his wife mm-hmm. named Ellie mm-hmm. what do you think it's why, why do you think it's important for kids to experience that kind of scene in a film hmm well I'm not sure why it's important for kids to, but I can tell you like the, the the way that was born really came backwards from uh, the desire to get away so that was really the the heart of uh, the beginning of Up was me realizing, oh, man, nobody told me as a director I'm just going to have to run, go, run around and talk to people all day. <laughs> I, I get exhausted. I'm not. I'm like an introvert, you know. So I I get tapped out and I want to hide under my desk. So the idea of floating away from everything just was so appealing, uh, and that's what started uh, this idea of Carl floating his house away. And then we thought, well, why? Why is he floating? His, why doesn't he just take the train? Hmm. You know, there's got to be a really good reason why he's floating his house with balloons. So then we came up with this whole backstory of this promise that he'd made to his wife, and it had to be really important. Otherwise, you would never buy the preposterousness of of flying his house hmm. to South America. So it really kind of was born backwards uh, out of uh, that desire to get away. And then once we got there, we realized, okay. We've got to make this uh, as truthful and believable. It can't be all, uh, you know, sun and roses. There's got to be some dark places to it. And I think that's ultimately why it speaks to people, because it's not just idealized. There's a lot of pleasant stuff, but then there are dark places and sadness and anger and so on that goes into this relationship. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that opening, I mean, the the best any human, I think, is going to do is get verklempt. The rest of <laughs> us are like sort of weeping, <laughs> weeping, watching this, you know, got you right from the get-go. I'm just curious, when Pete Doctor goes to see a movie, what kinds of scenes move you to tears? Because you're good at cer- certainly tapping into what makes us t- go into tears when we watch one of your films. Oh, well, thanks. I, 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 when people tell me, oh, I cried, they sort of get mad. And I always take it as the ultimate compliment because you can't fake that. Mm. You know? So that means that the film worked, which is uh, a great compliment to me and the rest of the team. Um, the films that I like are usually those kind of smaller uh, relationship films. I think of um, um, uh, The Station Agent by Tom McCarthy, uh, this great character-based film, uh, very simple. It's not tons of explosions. I'm not adverse to explosions. Mm. I like those too. But um, it's usually these really well-defined, wonderful characters that you just want to spend time with and that end up transforming each other. Mm. By bumping against each other, they end up changing each other. And and that's uh, the way life is. And I I really enjoy that. Mm. You're not going to name a film that makes you cry? Oh, that makes me cry. Uh, Let's see. Hmm. Maybe you don't cry. Oh, I definitely do, but I can't think of one right off the top okay. of my head. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. I'll let uh, you go. I'll let, okay. let you take a pass on that. <laughs> um, just as we sort of round out our conversation, I got young kids. And, uh-huh. um, you know, you you see as you watch your own kids, but as you observe other people's kids, and so, they, the children just feel the emotions so intensely yeah, and, and so so overtly. So what do you hope that Inside Out, through Inside Out, children and their parents um, – will understand about the emotions that really overwhelm us all, whether we're parents, whether we're kids. Well, there was a story that uh, we brought uh, a bunch of employees and their children to watch the film early on, just to make sure that it tracked, that kids could understand all the ins and outs of what we were portraying. And the next day, one of the the technical artists came back and said, I got to tell you this story. Uh, My son has been afraid to dive off the diving board into the pool. And after seeing the film... He went right in Mm -hmm. and we said, wow, that's amazing. He said, yeah, I just felt that fear was driving and I asked him to step aside. And we were, uh, you know, that was already the reason for making the film just there. You know, the fact that that a child had been made aware of this and realized that 
he is not fear. He's just being driven by fear at that moment. And so you can kind of own that. Mm, you that know? you can harness that emotion. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And even the ability to talk about it. You know, sometimes kids are so feel-based and internal that they're not even aware of it. You know, they can't name it. They can't discuss it with you. They can't say, I feel angry. They just stomp around and and are a pain in the butt, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So the fact that that you could talk about it and and maybe help kids be aware of it, I think would would be pretty cool. Pete Doctor, nice to talk to you. Looking forward to this one. Thank you. Thank you.